Shabbat Shalom and welcome to Beth Ariel's online Shabbat service from Montreal, Canada. You know, there is an age old question that keeps on coming up again and again. And the question is, what came first, the chicken or the egg? As believers in Genesis, in the account of Genesis, we claim that it must be the chicken because God formed the fowls, the birds of the air on the fifth day. But is this answer only for believers? Well, for all you ornithologists or students of birds, let's set the record straight. Back in 2010, in a lab in Scotland, they discovered that there is a protein found in the chicken's ovary that required, actually that was necessary for the formation of the eggshell. So without having the chicken first, you can't have the eggshell. Conclusion, the chicken had to come before the egg. I think that now we'll be able to consider this issue finally resolved. And I just love when science proves the Bible. Now, the next question you might ask is, why are we talking about what comes first? You see, this type of question stimulates us to seek a deeper understanding about the nature of God and how he does things which then sets an example for us. This is something that we're going to hear about in today's great message. As we make our way into Revelation chapter 8, we hear about the angel who takes that golden censer and brings these silent prayers of the saints before the throne of grace. And what then is the answer from the throne? Was it mercy or was it judgment? Which came first? Today we're going to hear how the thunder and the voices and the lightning and the earthquake is God's mercy in the form of warnings. God responds to the prayers of all those in heaven by granting humanity warning and an opportunity to repent. So what we see is mercy before the wrath, mercy before the judgment. Just like in the Garden of Eden, after Adam's sin, what came first? Was it mercy? Or was it judgment? Well, first came the promise that the serpent's head would be bruised and then came the punishment, the thorns and the thistles and the return to dust. Mercy before judgment. This proves once again the merciful character of God whose patience and goodness is proven every time he delays judgment with mercy first. But what makes this all even more exciting to consider is that once the judgment starts, it doesn't mean that the mercy stops. They can both be poured out simultaneously. Like when the prophet Habakkuk, speaking of the children of Israel while in exile, was asking the Lord to remember mercy during wrath. Habakkuk is saying, Lord, exercise mercy during this judgment of their exile. And what about David's punishment when he counted the children of Israel for war? The Lord actually reduced the plague, having mercy right there in the midst of punishment. And what about the Noahic flood? Here we see mercy after the punishment, when the Lord made an everlasting covenant with mankind and promised never to destroy the earth by flooding again. So what we can say is that with God, mercy is before during and even after the punishment. Mercy is omnipresent. And we depend upon that mercy every moment when we go through our own challenges. We depend upon the mercy of God. And so that brings us to the next question. What is our response? Our responsibility when it comes to mercy and judgment. We ourselves have been judged according to God's full and perfect mercy. Otherwise, none of us could stand before him. While justice begs for our condemnation, mercy won and our sins are not counted against us because of what Yeshua, the Messiah, did for us. That is why we have been told by Yeshua to be merciful in the same way that the Lord has been merciful to us. And we have been told by Yaakov, our brother James, that we must exercise mercy over judgment. Because we have experienced God's mercy, we have to allow that to control our response to others. So let's not be like the unmerciful servant. 
but let's be moved by compassion and mercy first. And even when judgment is necessary, let it be tempered by mercy, by forbearance, and by long suffering. You know what? Let's even go now and heap hot coals upon the heads of those who have wronged us to bless them, to sanctify them, and to do them good. And now we have one last question, but it's another chicken question. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, if you were Captain James Kirk from the USS Enterprise, this would be your answer. The chicken crossed the road to boldly go where no chicken has gone before. So then, let's cross over to the other side. Let us not be chicken or cowardly, but let us exercise brave faith dependence on Lord and look to exercise mercy and stand strong in his mercy that he has shown us so that we can rejoice with that cry that mercy triumphs over judgment. And let's be merciful and not so eager to judge and condemn remembering lest we be judged in that same way. So I hope that this has made you hungry for uh, an omelet, perhaps, <laughs> or for those who are vegan. What a great spiritually nutritious meal we're going to share together now in word and in worship. So we're going to invite Messianic leader Jacques Isaac Gabizon to this morning's service. Thank you, Sharon, and shalom, shalom on this beautiful day. Beautiful not because it's freezing outside, but because it is a time, a day that we chose to spend with the Lord in music, in worship, and in his word, of course. Mm. So we're going to read <coughs> from the scriptures together, and we start with Psalm 109. Do not keep silent, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. And we respond, let them curse, but you bless. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let your servant rejoice, for he shall stand at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. Amen. Lecture du psaume 138, versets 7 à 8. Quand je marche au milieu de la détresse, tu me rends la vie. Tu étends ta main sur la colère de mes ennemis et ta droite me sauve. L'Éternel agira en ma faveur. Éternel, ta bonté dure toujours. N'abandonne pas les œuvres de tes mains. Ensemble, psaume 57. Ô oh Dieu, en toi, mon âme cherche un refuge. Je cherche un refuge à l'ombre de tes ailes, jusqu'à ce que les calamités soient passées. Je crie au oh Dieu très haut, ô oh Dieu qui agit en ma faveur. Il m'enverra du ciel le salut. Dieu enverra sa bonté et sa fidélité. And from 2 Peter, chapter 3, we read, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. And from 1 Thessalonians, May the Lord establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Messiah Yeshua with all his saints. Lecture de 2 Pierre chapitre 3 « Des cieux existèrent autrefois par la parole de Dieu, de même qu'une terre tirée de l'eau est formée au moyen de l'eau, et que parce que ces choses, le monde d'alors périt, submergé par l'eau. L'avènement du jour de Dieu, les cieux enflammés se dissoudront et les éléments embrasés se fondront. » Second Corinthiens chapitre 5 et Hébreu 10 « Ensemble » Connaissant donc la crainte du Seigneur, nous cherchons à convaincre les hommes. C'est une chose terrible que de tomber entre les mains du Dieu vivant. From Colossians chapter 1, we pray that you may be invigorated and strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory to exercise every kind of endurance and patience 
perseverance and forbearance with joy giving thanks to the father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints god's holy people in the light and from luke 21 we read these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled watch therefore and pray always amen Lecture de Corinthiens, deuxième Corinthiens, chapitre 1. Ce qui fait notre gloire, c'est ce témoignage de notre conscience que nous nous sommes conduits dans le monde avec sainteté et pureté devant Dieu. Non point avec une sagesse charnelle, mais avec la grâce de Dieu. Ensemble, Romains 6, 22. Mais maintenant, étant affranchi du péché et devenu esclave de Dieu, vous avez pour fruit la sainteté et pour fin la vie éternelle. From 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And we respond together from Exodus 15. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Et psaume 86, mais toi Seigneur, tu es un Dieu miséricordieux et compatissant, lent à la colère, riche en bonté et en fidélité. Et ensemble, psaume 23, tu dresses devant moi une table en face de mes adversaires, tu induiles ma tête et ma coupe déborde. Amen and amen. Amen. Yes, Lord, you are slow to anger and you are rich in your loving kindness and we thank you for that. So we're going to continue on with the worship right now. Sadia Goan was an important Jewish commentator who lived around 900 AD and he beautifully said these words concerning Daniel's ancient of days. He said, his white hair, his white garments indicated the pure, kind intentions he had to purify his people from their sins. This is how close a rabbi understood how much we need the Lord to be cleansed and purified. Yeshua's head, his hair was white as snow. He is the fire which cleanses our conscience. And as light, it searches deep into every dark heart with a heat that never grows cold. Lord, melt our hearts, burn the dross so that we may praise you even more and every day say, behold, Lord, you are the God of our salvation. Thank you. La 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 
our hands with hot water and soap, we make ourselves less contagious. That is, we can eliminate the dangerous effects of the virus by just washing our hands. However, the moment the virus gets into our system, once it gets inside, soap and water can't help anymore. What this teaches us is that if we take care of sin at the very first contact, if we confess our sins and get washed by the cleansing waters of grace, 
the potential harm of what it can do on the inside is eliminated. Because once the virus enters, once the sin finds its nesting ground inside, we are at the mercy of its control over us. You know, I never had cleaner hands and nails since COVID-19 became our potential enemy. But we will never realize how clean a heart we can have when we have Messiah Yeshua in us. He is the cure for our every ailment. Lord, you make us kadosh. You make us holy inside. Yeah. 
adorons Adonai. Nous adorons Adonai nous t'adorons Seigneur en nous préparant à ce grand jour lorsque nous serons avec toi au paradis et lorsque nous allons t'adorer avec tous les saints de tous les temps Seigneur avec Abraham, Isaac et Jacob avec Moïse avec David avec Zacharie Seigneur nous allons t'adorer ô éternel notre Dieu le Père Saint, Père, Fils et Esprit, nous allons t'adorer. Et aujourd'hui, Seigneur, tu nous donnes le privilège de le faire déjà maintenant sur cette terre. Et tu nous donnes le privilège de t'offrir ces offrandes. Seigneur, nous les offrons avec joie parce que nous savons que tout ce que nous avons t'appartient au Éternel. Et nous voulons juste te donner ce petit de nous, Seigneur, que tu puisses le multiplier et que ça puisse te servir, servir ton royaume, servir l'avancement de ton royaume et ton église. Merci de ce que tu fais pour chacun de nous et que ton nom soit béni au nom de Jésus. Do you see how big the heavens are? That's how big our opportunity is to enter into heaven. Each star sends out an invitation. Each colorful galaxy, a nebula begs us again and again to consider who is behind this immense expanse of creation. A brother shared with me last week this thought, that as large as the universe is, God chooses the smallest of things, like the number of Jews on this planet, to demonstrate that he is not drawn by grandeur, but he operates by grace, and even the smallest of our needs will be met by God's promises.
Because when he promises, it's forever. The Lord upholds all that fall and raises up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you and you give them the meat in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. And to the promise to Israel, he says in Jeremiah 31, But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and inscribe it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will each man teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, who sets in order the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts, that is his name. days about to dawn when I will make a new covenant with Jacob because I've loved them with an everlasting love and I will have compassion on them I will put my law within them I will write it on their hearts I will be their God and they my people the greatest to the least, they will know their God, and I will remove all their sin. Thus says the Lord, if you could measure the heavens and all the stars fall from the sky, then only then will I count of my chosen, only then will I cease to call it. Je mettrai ma loi dans leurs âmes, je l'écrirai dans leur cœur. Je serai leur Dieu et eux mon peuple. Et de plus petit au plus grand, tous me connaîtront et j'effacerai tous leurs péchés. L'Éternel dit si on peut mesurer les cieux, si les étoiles des mers. Je rejetterai mes élus, alors seulement je réunirai Israël. When I bring them back from exile, I will bless the land, my holy dwelling place in Zion. I will give strength to the weary, I will satisfy the faint, and give rest to those who call my name. Thus says the Lord, if you can measure the heavens and all the stars fall from the sky, then only then will I cast off my chosen, only then will I cease to call Israel mine. Thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord, if you can measure the heavens and all the stars fall from the sky then only then will I cast off my chosen only then will I cease to call Israel mine only then will I cease to call Israel mine only then will I cease to call Israel mine 
Shalom, shalom, and welcome back to Bet Ariel Shabbat service. You know, as we, as we move deeper into the book of Revelation, we see the reality of what is predicted, that the world's attention will increasingly turn toward Israel, who will become the center, the focal point of these end-time prophecies. Chapter 16 of Revelation sees all or much of the armies of our planet heading there, northern Israel, to the valley of Armageddon for the final showdown. And in our study of chapter Chapter 8 today, uh, we will see one of these armies coming from the east, from the rising sun, as the Greek says, an army inconceivably large, numbering 200 million soldiers and heading right to the land of Israel. And so far, and for now close to a year, the world's attention has been primarily focused on the pandemic, and so we tend to forget many subtle and dangerous things that are still continuing behind the scenes. And one of those issues is the ongoing anti-Semitism. It is alive and well. The latest and growing trend we hear is the accusation that the Jewish people are the cause of COVID-19. Warnings came in a report released last Sunday that the coronavirus pandemic is being used by Iran and others to spread conspiracy theories that point to the Jews for causing the outbreak of COVID-19 in order to prof profit financially from the ensuing chaos. The report says, and I quote, the rising rates of anti-Semitic sentiments are expected to lead to a significant increase in violence against Jews and the Jewish and Jewish sites in 2021. This is expected to challenge communities around the world, especially the American Jewish community and also the Canadian one. Let me show you one picture that is circulating. In this image shared on Telegram on March 15, the coronavirus is presented as a transient horse for globalist Jews. The image appears to be mocking individuals eager for the collapse of society in their excitement for the coronavirus. The monster of anti-Semitism never takes the time to rest but continues to surface at every opportunity. And this is another déjà vu, by the way. During the bubonic plague or the Black Death back in 1348 to 1351, which killed 25 million people, the Jews actually were accused of poisoning the wells, the water supplies of, of, of the neighborhoods. What followed was a series of violent attacks on Jewish communities. And they thrown Jews into pits, fields, or houses for the purpose of being burnt alive. Now, without even having the book of Revelation as their backup source of information, Israel Diaspora's affair ministry has this past week predicted that there will be a steep rise in anti-Semitic incidents around the world this coming year, 2021. And all these things I just mentioned fall at the time of the anniversary of the International Holocaust Memorial Day, which was commemorated this past Wednesday, January 27th. On this day, this, the European Jewish Association held a large online gathering to honor the memory of those who perished during, and I quote, one of the darkest period in world history. You know, as, 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 as students of prophecies, our heart is so moved when we realize that the Hebrew scripture prophets like Joel and Daniel and even Yeshua himself spoke of yet another darker period of world and Jewish history that is to come. We ought to remember this. We remember the words of the prophet Daniel. And there will be a time, he says, of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Amen. These words, by the way, of Daniel are spoken almost verbatim by Yeshua himself. And then he goes on to say, Yeshua goes on to say in Matthew 24, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This time is coming very soon. And while we will study the details of these words into, of chapter 8 of Revelation, perhaps amongst the most difficult verses to read, in the scriptures. We want to draw our attention to the last words of the prophecy of Yeshua and of Daniel. Everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And so it is our prayer as we, we are about to consider the description of this world conflict to come that many, many will come to a saving knowledge of the Messiah 
for this is the main purpose of these details for us today. Now, on a brighter note, this past week, th there was a significant archaeological discovery in southern Israel in Timna Park, Timna Park, just north of Elat. They, they found an ancient cloth of royal purple dated 3,000 years ago to the time of King David. What makes this significant and moving <laughs> is that while well, we are at least there are at least 50 different shades of red, but now we can see the true purple color that is associated with royalty and the priesthood as well as the textiles used in the tabernacle in Jewish in the Jewish temple. You know, the center picture is a microscopic view of one of the pieces of garment found that you see in the upper left. They, they, they believe that this very textile might have been worn by King David himself and by King Solomon as well. The purple, co purple color is called Argaman or Tyrian purple, which was created by snail's dye. It actually actually required a huge amount of these snails for just a small amount of dye. You know, this is one of the many discoveries which brings that era of Bible history alive. Now, before we delve into Rev Revelation, let us first bless our children as it is our tradition and also priority. If you have your children, of course, bring them close to you. Put your hand upon them. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevon Malchuto Leolam Vaed. Blessed be His name, whose glorious kingdom is coming and is forever and ever. Avinu Malkenu, our Father and King, we as one congregation, as one body, lift up our children to Your throne and pray for great blessings and protection for each one of them. Lord, so often we as parents are anxious for our children. We worry about their safety, their health, and spiritual condition but we take great comfort in your love for them and constant protection for them and also we pray that their love for you would grow and increase in Yeshua's name we pray they will develop an, a, an eternal perspective and purpose not an earthly one help them to see life through you help them to realize your comforting and strengthening presence with and within them Beshem Yeshua Mashiach Amen and Amen let us now open our Bibles to chapter 8 of Revelation. Great chapter. Though we will see the clear and striking descriptions of all the calamities that will fall on this planet through the blowing of the seven trumpets, there is that one touch of grace from the Lord we have already begun to see last week. The first verse of the chapter speaks of a silent prayer in heaven from everyone present there including angels and the elders this will happen for half an hour or half a time which may correspond to half of the seven year period tribulation that is okay the three and a half years during which everyone in heaven will pray and while the world will be covered with prayer from above this whole silent period begins with one angel pouring over the earth coals of fire which were taken from the golden altar of incense in heaven but what why that is take charcoals of fire and throw them over the whole earth what is this what is the significance of this let us read the passage and try to understand the the angels special action here verses three to five it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with, with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunders and sounds and flashes of light and an earthquake. You know, as John sees the seven angels ready to blow the seven trumpets of judgment, he notices another scene which precedes the blowing of the trumpets. An angel takes the fire or the burning coals from the altar, the golden altar, and throw it on the earth. This may not at all be an act of judgment. 
But when considering the origin of the fire and other passages, it may primarily be an act of blessing, of sanctification and of warning, an action of grace over the earth before the judgment are poured out through the seven trumpets. The golden altar of incense is that of prayer and what the angel is doing is pouring on prayer over the world. But how does this work? We recognize the golden altar from the book of Isaiah. When the prophet was taken up for his anointing, he describes a similar scene that John actually describes here. Isaiah saw seraphim around the throne of God and together they were saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. This is the same acclamation John heard from the same angels in chapter 4. But see what happens with Isaiah as he saw the Lord sitting on the throne. It says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with thongs, and touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. As Isaiah realized his utter sinfulness, for, for this is the reaction of one w w when we see the holiness of God. He confessed his sin, but right away a seraph flew to him with a burning cold and touched his lips and cleansed him and sanctified him. At this point, Isaiah was ready to go and proclaim the word of God. But where did the angel get this call from? from the altar of incense, the same altar we see in Revelation, the golden altar of incense, from where another angel took the coals and poured them, poured them over the earth. In Isaiah, the coals had the purpose of sanctifying and cleansing, and so in Revelation 8, just before the pouring out of the judgment on earth, an act of great grace, coals of fire are poured on it for the same purpose to bless, to prepare those hearts who will come to see and accept the Messiah, because let's not forget, so many are going to come to believe then. After all, this is the main reason why the Lord overextends these calamities, so that many will have more than once a chance to change their minds and, like Isaiah, repent of their sins and be sanctified. And furthermore, when one reads the original text of Isaiah, there's one word that will remind us of the scene in Revelation 8. When Isaiah speaks of being undone or ruined, this same word, ruined, okay, also means to be quiet. To be quiet. When he said, woe is, woe is me for I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. The holiness of God brought him to be quiet, to bow down in front of the awesome realization of the divine when it came to his own sins. Perhaps the quietness in prayer was invoked when seeing the sanctity of God in relation to our smallness. This leaves us in quiet awe and in prayer. This adds, by the way, to the solemnity of the sin in heaven and the powers of prayer being in front of the holiness of God himself. And there is, there is further something like very powerful and a practical application for us today. We recall has how these calls are mentioned in the book of Proverbs and in the book of Romans in order to teach us to pray and to forgive even our enemies. These two verses are found in Proverbs 25, 22 and Romans 12, 20. Let me read Romans for you. He says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. What does it mean to heap coals of fire on his head? Not to burn him and add to his punishment, but on the contrary, it is, it is like repeating the action of these angels who brought a coal from the altar of incense and touched Isaiah's mouth to bless the person and to sanctify the person. This action we're called to restate speaks of the love we ought to have toward our enemies by doing good to them. And in Proverbs, by the way, you, the, the Spirit adds at the end, and the Lord will reward you. 
the word reward is salam, meaning complete and sound from where we have the word shalom. That is, if you do this, you, you, you will have peace. The shalom of the Lord, just like the smoke of the incense. This is the power of the coals of the altar of incense, that of covering and blessing. And this may very well be the heaven's intention before judgment is poured on earth in Revelation 8. And when we read the coals, of the coals were poured on the earth. What about the thunder and the sounds and the lightning and the earthquake in chapter 8? Should these be considered the sounds of judgment even before the seven trumpets of judgment are blown? The sounds of lightning and the thunder is what John heard also when he first came and saw the throne of God along with these sounds and lightnings. They were these peaceful colors of Yaspis, right, and, and Sardis, and a rainbow around the throne. The same words in Revelation 4, 4 are also found here in Revelation 8. These signs serve to enhance the power, the awesomeness of the wonder of the presence of God. These are heard and felt in heaven just before the judgments are poured. Just very similar to what the Israelites saw and heard on Mount Sinai to stamp the presence of God. You know, when the Lord visited Israel on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, we read that he descended on the mount and in fire, fire while smoke of a furnace ascended. And there we read that the whole mountain quaked. There was an earthquake, a violent one. And with this, the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, and God spoke to Moses with thunder, it says. Yes, no one was hurt by the earthquake, no one was hurt by the fire, for these were not seen as judgment poured forth, but rather demonstration, that is, of the presence and the holiness of God. So, so far, it is a great privilege to see these things in heaven only only the bible can reveal to us and another prophet by the way testify as well of this great sin with a focus actually on the angels ezekiel too was brought up to heaven to see this great scene this is what is he says so passionately in ezekiel 113 as he focuses on the angels the seraphims okay and the calls he says as for the likeness of the living creatures, they, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright and out of the fire went lightning. Right? They, they, they were so engaged, the, the seraphim, they were so engaged in their work of promoting and encouraging a sanctified life for the believer that they themselves personified these coals of fire. Their appearance, Ezekiel says, were, were, was like coals of fire. This is why they are called seraphim, which is from the word sarab, meaning to burn. They're burning for God. That is what it is like in heaven as the angels are always in amazement in front of the great holiness of God. No wonder that they would spend this time in prayer, being in front of God and knowing that the judgment will be poured on earth. But there's another word that is used which, used that which further describes the depth of the action of pouring coals of fire on the earth. In Revelation 8, it is the word translated censor. Okay, when we read in verse 3 that another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer. But I want to tell you this is not the usual word for censor. What the Greek Greek says literally is frankincense instead of censor. Libanotos, the same frankincense the Machais brought to Yeshua. But why wasn't the usual word for censor used? Why and why is it golden? It seems that our language and imagination are limited and cannot describe all the wonders in heaven. And so we are brought above what we can save and conceive. The incense itself was made of a mixture of a few spices, but the frankincense is chosen among one of them. The frankincense is chosen, and this reminds us of the finished work of the Messiah who had died and now resurrected and now ready to bless. Another ingredient, by the way, they used in the incense was myrrh. But myrrh is a symbol of death and sacrifice. This time, however, it is in his frankincense which is pointed to, depicting the Lamb of God ready again 
to bless and to save. Frankincense, again, is a symbol of the deity of the Messiah. It tells us that he who was from eternity, from everlasting, as Micah tells us, came down to give his love as a ransom for many. The censer, which is the frankincense, along with the prayers of the believers, will remind those on earth of this great fact. And furthermore, the title Golden Frankincense reminds us of the golden oil, if you remember, which flowed from the menorah that, as, that Zachariah saw coming from heaven on the two witnesses. We read in Zachariah 4.12, What are these two olive branches that drip into the, res the respectable of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Here is golden oil poured from heaven on those who do the work of God. And here again, we are brought to see something out of this world when we read of the word for branches, which is the word sibolet, which really means ears of grains. This means that the branches were so laden with oil, that is with olive oil, that they resemble ears of grain that filled with his kernel. This is how the Lord is ready to bless all those who will be under judgments right it is hard to conceive by the way of ears of grains when, when you think of olives but the idea is that the lord is so willing to bless and to equip and so comparing these two passages between the golden oil and the golden frankincense we see god's willingness to greatly again bless this world which is about to undergo such a very very difficult period of time and this is so good to know and this is the first thing to know when we speak about the judgments to come. And it is only after all of this pouring of blessings and great act of grace that the seven angels who are holding the seven trumpets were now ready to sound them one after the other. And what we learn here and what we see over and over again, and I want to repeat this point, is that God will always provide blessings in the most dire circumstances. You know, I read this past week one Midrash which must have been composed at the time when the Jewish people were under great persecutions and, and, and pogroms around 1080. And one rabbi in, in reading the scriptures noticed that even while experiencing the wrath of God, one can find solace in his word and in his presence. This man took comfort in remembering that when pushed to the limits, the Lord once decreed to blow out the name of Israel under heaven, as we see in Deuteronomy 9. But right away, we're told that he relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people, Exodus 32. Like it was said in Micah, Israel can say, when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. When the nation of Israel will go through Jacob's trouble, that's another title for the tribulation, we're immediately told that he will be saved out of it in Jeremiah 30 verse 7. And we can add another words, other words from the prophet Habakkuk, who was so affected by the evil in his days, but then the Lord brought him right where the book of Revelation 8 is. And he wrote, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of, of the year in the midst of the year make it known in wrath remember mercy Habakkuk was transported to the tribulation time as he describes the words of the end time and he spoke of the midst of the years twice twice which corresponds to the middle of the tribulation and there he asks God to remember mercy and right away right in the next verse we we are brought right away to the second coming where it says and God came from Taman the, the holy one from Mount Paran the, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. This vision sums up well the account of the seven trumpets which begin in verse 6 and which says, And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. The trumpets brings us to the beginning of the second part of the tribulation, as you can see in the graph. This trumpet proceeds out of the seventh 
seal. You have the seventh seal, out of it comes the seventh trumpet. We remember that when the seals were opened and the scroll enrolled, it had writing on the back and in the front of it. Perhaps the trumpet's account is what is written in the back, since both the seals and the trumpets recount similar judgments and chronology, although it should be noted that the trumpets have a greater degree of punishment. John then is brought to see the second part of the tribulation and its entirety through many different scenes, like seeing a story from different angles, as in a court case. When many witnesses are brought in, each one saw something at a certain time and place, some witness, witness part of the beginning, others at the end. Each saw something that the others didn't. And as you can see on the chart, the seal present the entire seven years. The first covers the entire period of the first three and a half years, that is the first seal. The second to the sixth seal present the story of the last three and a half years. And out of the seventh seal again come the seventh trumpet. The first to the fourth trumpet recount the events of the second part again of the three and a half years. That is the, the first that is the part the second part of the seven years. While the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh trumpet concentrate on the last five months, a time which is mentioned twice in chapter 8. The fifth, the sixth, and the seven trumpets are also identified as the three woes. This wrath of the woes will be extremely intense and are divided into seven bowls, which seem to again focus primarily on these five months of wrath, which we will consider later. Let us consider the first four trumpets for now. Like the seals, they can be divided in section of four plus three. With the seals, they were the four horsemen and then the last seals. Here also, we have the first trumpets and later we will see that the last tr three trumpets corresponds to the last woes. All of this may appear complicated, but it will become clearer as we move forward into the book and as more details are provided. The nature of the first four trumpets is unique, by the way, as they are mainly concentrated on nature. And the question we ask is why the destruction of the earth? However, again, it is limited to one third of each judgment of, you know, in one third of the attempt to completely destroy the earth, as we have previously seen, by the way. If one counts the word third within the judgment of the seventh trumpet in chapter eight and nine, one will see that we have 13 thirds, 13 kind of judgment and 13 thirds. What this tells us is one more time, con it confirms is that 13 times over that the Lord is present and sovereign, restraining evil and allowing only one third to be destroyed and no more. And this is done with the hope that many will realize God's mercy in the midst of wrath and run to him for salvation. This is why the Lord is extending the whole thing. Let us sum up this judgment of the fourth trumpet of the four trumpet that is from verse 7 we begin a list of destruction of one third of this judgment that we have seen previously it's one third of the trees one third of the sea one third of the sea life one third of the sheep, one third of the rivers one third of fresh waters one third of the moon one third of the sun one third of the stars one third of the day and night and twice we are told of the destruction of one third of mankind and no more for now and reading on of the means of the destruction it will be mainly by fire by fire we read that the third of the trees were burned up and all the grass was burned up we read of something like a, a burning mountain with fire which falls we read of a great star burning like a torch of fire where does the fire come from Perhaps through the wars and exchange of different types of bombs, all of this destruction is man-made. And to give you a sense of the severity of these things, let us read about the first three trumpets, verses 7 and 9. It says, The first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass, green grass, was burned up. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. 
and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and, and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. You know, reading this, I want to run to Yeshua for salvation. And see, by the way, how nature, it is the nature that is destroyed. Why then this fury inflicted on nature? First, we can perceive that these things destroyed were and what, what is basic necessities to men. The trees provide food. The green grass provides food for the cattle which feeds men. The life in the sea, fish and all kinds of seafood also provide food. And see especially the fresh water whose accessibility worldwide will decrease of one third. And we know, we know especially in the Middle East and even today how water is so precious and ready, already causes conflict between these countries. These first trumpets are the detailed outcome of the second and third seal which spoke of war and famine. And, and at this point in the tribulation, the Antichrist, by the way, having used the first three and a half years to, to try to establish his utopian kingdom, obviously failed. So now, at the midpoint of tribulation, and since the world is not at his feet, he resorts to violence, he resorts to war. The lack of food and water will bring him to demands that his followers be branded with the mark of the beast, the number 666. This mark would be the needed sign allowing people to buy or sell even the most basic necessities like food, like water, which would then be in such short supply and in a very high demand. These things will trigger wars all over the world, culminating to Armageddon. Further. Notice what is destroyed at the second trumpet. In verse 9, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Ships at the time of John in the first century were a fast mode of transportation for people and for goods. Today we can think of planes, of trucks, of trains. What we can understand is that the Antichrist will attempt to destroy even the world economy as he sees himself losing something the coronavirus is giving us a small taste of. We read in Revelation 18 that toward the very end, the world economy will completely collapse just before the second coming. There it mentions ships as the means of riches. See the people's response as they, as they see the collapse. We read in Revelation 18:19. It says, And they threw dust on their, on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she was made desolate. The full hour may here indicate the seven-year period of the tribulation, which will see an economic growth first but then a full collapse at the end this is what is meant by the destruction of the ships and the uh, the blowing of the second trumpet and while we may have expected the fury to be directed on men alone something that the fifth the sixth and the seventh trumpet will emphasize we see how the first third and fourth trumpet concentrate on nature itself why again as we mentioned before, it would appear that something else seems to be under attack. That is God's everlasting covenant with man and nature, which he ratified with Noah in Genesis 9.16. The rainbow, it says, shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember what? The everlasting covenant between God and every living thing of all flesh that is on earth. It is a covenant with the earth, with humanity, and, and with every living thing. This covenant is everlasting. That means it does not depend on man. It is irrespective of human action. Is this what the evil one is trying to reverse in the tribulation by first coming with his own covenant of false peace and attempting to burn trees and grass and killing fish and stopping the economy of the world? He could actually, but only one third. You know, his action reminds us of a thief who enters a house and after not finding what he wants, he burns everything. This shows us that utter evil is a bad loser and incapable of repentance. The major news here is, is that the thief cannot come out of the house. It is his own destruction that he causes. You know, there's a strong correlation, by the way, between the flood, the flood which brought actually 
the story of Noah and the covenant, the everlasting covenant. And so there's a strong correlation between the flood and the tribulation. In both cases, demons were involved. In both instances, they were they, they tried to invade the earth. In Genesis, they came down right on the woman, if you remember. Right? And in the fifth trumpet, we're going to see, we're, we're going to see a huge, that is, demonic invasion, something we will see next time. Furthermore, as we mentioned before, see the duration of the flood was what? 150 days as we read in Genesis 7:24, And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. In Bible, the Bible calendar, a year is 30 days per month. 30 days in five months gives us 150 days. And so it is the same with the five months, right? In the same way, the last and worst part of the tribulation will last five months, as mentioned in Revelation 9, 5 and 9, 10. You know, the preservation of creation is also later stressed toward the end of the first <coughs> rendering of the tribulation time as a sign of victory. We read in Revelation 10 where we see an angel with a rainbow upon his head. This is in verse 1. Who swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no more. Here we are guaranteed that the creation itself, the earth and the sea and the things in it, will not completely be destroyed. All of these things gives us a good idea of the motives behind the future wars. But it is not only the devil that is responsible. In the Hebrew scriptures, those responsible for breaking the everlasting covenant are men who follow the evil one. When we turn to Isaiah 24, which speaks of the same subject that we have here in Revelation 8, that is the judgment on the, on the earth, God says in verse 5, the earth is also defiled by his inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Here man is responsible for breaking the everlasting covenant okay, by mishandling God's place, this planet, and often mishand mishandling also animals. The permanent covenant was understood by even Ibn Ezra in, the, in, the com in his commentary on Isaiah to contain the natural order of things. It is, in his own words, the covenant for the whole universe. That there is suffering in the creation. It is actually due to our own action. This is what Paul says. If you remember this great passage of Romans 8, he says that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know, he says, that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. It is. It is. The creation as it is now is in a sad state. Animals eating other animals, all living in fear. And while these things will increase during the tribulation times, as the trumpets tells us, just imagine, imagine how beautiful they will be when the Messiah comes back. There's a day coming when, as Isaiah said, or says in, in Isaiah 65, 11, that the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. This is actually Isaiah 11. Soon all animals will not be carnivores anymore, but vegetarians as they were originally created. And they will eat together. There's going to be complete arm harmony between man and nature. Now, beyond these physical catastrophes, there is actually a spiritual aspect. <coughs> In fact, it is at the core of this conflict. Notice what comes out of the third trumpet, a star named Wormwood. What is it? And why is it called this way? And what does it represent? Let's read verses 10, 11. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Whatever this star may be, perhaps an attempt to poison another country's water supply or whichever, uh, whatever water is left, what the symbolic meaning of the warm word, it goes right to the root 
of the problem. It actually, Wormwood represents, is a symbol of idolatry, is a symbol of the departure from God with false teaching and false prophecies. Wormwood itself is a small gray leaf plant that is so bitter that even a small amount could make food and water unusable for consumption. But Moses directly compares this with idols and false religion. In Deuteronomy, after speaking of these idols, he says, So that there may not be among you men or women or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. And that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. Same word. See how Moses describes idolatry, which is false teaching. He speaks of it as bitterness. He speaks to it as wormwood. The picture was uh, of a root spreading, spreading that is poisoned or bitterness into the whole tree, like the spread of false teaching within the body of the Messiah. The word bitterness in, in the Hebrew designates venom from snakes. Later, God used it in Jeremiah twice to describe the idolatry of the people and the reason why Jerusalem was destroyed first. This is in Jeremiah 23, 15. He says, Behold, I'm going to feed them wormwood and make them drink poisonous water. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, pollution has gone forth into all the land. All the land. Idolatry, especially here, false prophecies, are the root of all these wars. If only men will turn to God, nothing of this sort will happen. You know, there's a legend which tells <coughs> of the origin of Wormwood. <coughs> it says that this plant sprang up in the track of the serpent as it withered along the ground when driven out of paradise. And among the great number of books authored by C.S. Lewis is the highly provocative The Screwtype Letters, where the author describes well the effect of Wormwood. In the fi this fictional story, the devil briefs his nephew, Wormwood on the subtleties and techniques, techniques that is of tempting the people. The goal, he counsels, is not wickedness, but indifference. There, Satan cautions his nephew Wormwood to keep the prospect, the patient, comfortable at all costs. If he should become concerned about anything of importance, encourage him to think about his other plans, like what to eat at lunchtime. And then, this definitive job description, and I quote the book, I, the devil, will always see that to it that there are bad people. Your job, my dear Wormwood, is to provide me with people who do not care, who do not care. See, it's not only bad teaching, but prof prophecies is when we don't care about what the Word says, and especially today, that we don't care about the prophecies that we can see coming so fast. And there's, of course, so much to say about this chapter and especially about the fourth the, and particularly about the fifth, the sixth and seventh trumpet. We will keep on next week. Now to conclude, <coughs> one thing we will increasingly be aware as we go deeper into the tribulation is that God is really looking after the welfare of the believer. That is his priority. Beyond all prophecies, that is his supremacy, a main concert of his. We have seen how the angel poured out the purifying coals uh, f from the golden altar of frankincense that is over all the, the earth and how all heaven will pray during the three and a half years. It will pray not only for men to be saved, but also for the protection, the safeguard of the believers then. God himself will point out, actually it will hide them from the wrath of the evil one as we're going to see in chapter 12 it's going to be so terrible that he actually does that he takes believers and he hides them from the fury of the devil i want to close with one powerful psalm of protection written by david who even even though he was surrounded by bodyguards and had a, 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 that is a powerful army around him yet he looked unto god for protection it is in Psalm 18, right after David expressed his deep love for God and, and said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And he pronounced these powerful words. He says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. 
my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Did you count how many items he mentioned to express God's unlimited protection? Actually, there are seven of them. The perfect number for a full defense. And, and David uses military terms here. First, he is my strength, Hetzek. It, it speaks of being mentally and physically strong for God wants to have fit soldiers. And he will provide the means for it. Second, he's my rock, Salah, that is a rock, a, a, a very high cliff, a Petra, that, that can't be moved by any who would want to harm us. Third, my fortress, a, 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 or a place of saf safety, that is, where, where, where the enemy can't follow. It is a fortified structure, Medzuda, from where we get the word Masada, if you remember, if you went to Israel, how high it was. Fourth, he is my deliverer, palat, meaning to, to escape or to break through as the Lord allows us to escape from danger and at the same time gives us the strength and power to go forward, to pierce through. Fifth, he is my shield that comes between us and harm, magen, from the word ganan, meaning to defend, to put a shield about. Six. The horn of my salvation, the horn speaks of power and salvation, Yetzar, from the word Yazar, and from where we get the name of our Savior, Yeshua. So we are not only protected, we are made strong in Him. And finally, the seventh, He is my stronghold, Mizgab, which is not only a refuge, but also means a high point, high, a lofty place. This word is from Sagab, meaning of one who is inaccessibly high like a child carried by his father up up there let us bow our head in prayer i will pray an ancient prayer heavenly father let us give praise to god on high he is blessed and is to be blessed for no one is like you O lord for you are great in holiness and doing wonderful things. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, and the God of our Father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God who is great, powerful, and revered, the God most high, the Lord of heaven and earth, our shield and the shields of our fathers, the God who increases our faithfulness in every generation. Blessed are you, O Lord, for you are the shield of Abraham, and you are the shield of everyone who humbly comes to you with a repentant heart. Today, Lord, we have seen how the action of some disturb you. But there again, you are so loving, so patient, not wanting anyone to perish. All this we pray in the name of the one sitting at your right hand, Yeshua Mashiach. And to all the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. I'm eternally grateful to Jesus for all he has done for me. He has given me life and salvation, given me liberty. Oh Lord, I praise and I bless your name. of salvation and call upon his name through his blood I have redemption a brand new life I claim oh Lord I praise and I bless your name give the glory to you to you my heart there in your hands teach me to worship you bless the Lord